tools we'll be using to rig. So when you looked at those rigs I gave you for the um, swinging rope thing, whatever that was, when you looked at the rig um, for the tower, a lot of those same concepts are in there. Every single rig you look at is going to have similar attributes to it, similar tools that you've used. It's just a matter of how you apply them. And there's no one way to do something. I'm going to do something different than you might see somebody else do and vice versa. So um, this is a better fish than my other one, except for the texture is kind of screwed up because Mari's acting really funny. Like, that shouldn't be there, obviously. Um, but I'm just going to save this and go to a new scene just so we can see some of the tools that we would use. So they actually have like a rigging menu now, like in 2015 or 2014, I believe, they didn't have a rigging menu, everything was just under one. So it's kind of easy to find where the stuff is at at least. Um, a lot of the stuff that we're gonna be doing is, um, for the fish at least, is deformer rigging, meaning that we're not gonna actually be creating a bone system. Uh, if you look at, um, Rigging reel. Oops. If you look at a rigging reel, um, you're probably going to see a lot of things like this where you have all these controls here. Okay? The way that they get this character to look so realistic and to feel like his jaw is actually open and his eyes are actually up is because a lot of this is based on creating joints, creating basically a skeleton underneath the figure that does move like a real skeleton and even creating muscles underneath the skin to make the muscles feel like they're moving correctly okay <laughs> so stuff like this is how they get it to happen so they actually build like like skeleton like bones underneath the skin They'll put muscles on top of the skin, and that way as you move stuff around, it all works, right? Now this is a large endeavor, okay? So we could literally, there's actually degrees uh, where you spend four years studying um, all the stuff to create a humanistic rig, okay? So in this class, obviously we're not gonna be able to touch on every single feature to create a humanistic rig, but I want to point you in the right direction so you can see where this stuff happens. The biggest thing that we have to kind of look at, there's another good example, um, is how things are moving and then we're trying to emulate how those things would actually move in the real world. There you go, there's some more stuff there, more stuff there, okay? So uh, we're gonna be using a couple of things and a lot of the stuff we're gonna use for the fish is gonna come under the D4 menu, all right? So we've already kind of looked at these a little bit. <clears throat> Oh, Dylan, what do you have these for? I'm just going to reset my stuff here. There we go. All right, so for anything that we do animation-wise, we need points for stuff to happen. So if I wanted to take this cylinder and I wanted it to bend, you know, like a, like a curve, I need more points because right now I only have points here and points there. And if I move this, that's what happens, okay? So we need to have points in this. So I'm gonna go to my um, subdivisions and just crank them up. Now, in some cases, you don't want to start off with a million divisions because it just makes your job harder to tweak any of this stuff, okay? So we always want our points to be at a good number and as you progress and as you get experience, you'll find out what those numbers are, okay? For the fish, we're just keeping it at a pretty low resolution because of what we have to do with it. So with this, I can crank it up pretty high because it's just a little demo piece and it's not going to hurt me later on. So under deform, here's a whole bunch of stuff that we could play with. So um, under the nonlinear, a lot of this is how we're going to be rigging the fish. So one of these is a bend, okay? And all of these pretty much work the same way. Every time you click on an object and you click one of these things, you get some sort of handlebar. So right now I have this straight line. That straight line has to match the direction I want it to bend in, okay? Meaning if this thing is rotated down like this, like that, this has to match that same direction. So I would have to rotate this down like that. 
okay? It also has to be kind of centered inside it so that it bends correctly. So on this bend, you'll see that there is a curvature. That's what I'm gonna be tweaking to get this to work. Now, um, if you haven't caught on already, because I didn't catch on because I'm so used to doing it the other way, these things here are actually like sliders now. Before, we would click on the word and middle mouse button click and drag, and that would be a slider. Well, you don't need to do that anymore. Now, as I hover my mouse over this, I can just click and drag, and it automatically will slide, okay? Now, there are limits to it. You can see that it only goes a certain distance. Oops. So, if, in this case, I wanna go further, I can click on the word, and then middle mouse button click and drag, and I can go much further. So, you can see how I can use this bend handle to actually bend this shape. Now let's say that I only wanted to bend a portion of this, okay? That's what the low bound and the high bound are used for. So if I take the low bound to zero, you'll see that it only bends half of this. Okay? Now if I do this, then I have like a wagging tail, just like our fish. Our fish is gonna have basically like a wagging tail. So there we go. That's how we are gonna rig, um, well, par part of those stuff is how we're gonna rig that. Now, if that one wasn't the correct direction, then I would take the high bound to zero, and then I would wag the other side, okay? So imagine that this bar is two sections. We have a positive side and a negative side. And if I scoot this off, you can actually see it do it, okay? So you see how this bar comes up and over. If I put this back to one, now it also comes down and over. And as I use this curvature, what's happening is it's bending along that. So we're isolating different areas. And because I'm not right centered on this, it's bending it in kind of this like weird fashion where it's going like, ooh, like that. Okay? There's no way to separate the two where one goes one direction, one goes the other. Huh? There's oh, no yes there is. I would do this, and I would click on this again. I would add another bend. I would make this one negative, and I would bend it that way. A million and a half. There we go. A million and a half and one. Try it out and let me know. See my would crash. So we can we can add multiple deformers to this. So like our fish, everything that we want to move on the fish is going to have a deformer. So his left fin will have a deformer. His right fin will have a deformer. His um, pectoral fin will have a deformer. His tail will have a deformer. Okay. So all of these are great because they're really cool for creating this kind of like fluid motion, all right? So for now, I'm just gonna delete these and you'll see it goes back. What, what? All based on the position of the deformer? The position of the deformer and that bend, that curvature thing. But as far as what gets deformed? Correct, correct. So if, uh, also if I take this here and let's say I go like this, I could move this too. So I can go, this is bent more, this is bent less. So I can actually move this that way, still eliminate one of these and control how this is bending. Now, even though we're seeing this for, for rigging stuff, you can also use a lot of these tools for modeling too. So if I'm modeling a candy cane for some reason, there we go, I have a candy cane almost. Just a bit more curvature in there. And now I have a candy cane or just a regular cane, depending on your mood. All right, the other one we have is flare. So I click on flare. And I go to flare here, and you'll see that we have different options. I have start and end, I have curve, I still have low bound and high bound. Every one of these, low bound does the same thing, and high bound does the same thing. They're not gonna change what they do, okay? Start flare X does this, start flare Z does that, okay? So again, we could use this for a modeling tool to, to model different things. Megaphone, Megaphone. Mm -hmm. okay? We can also use this curve feature to kind of warp it a little bit. Okay, now all of these are animatable. That's the point, is that we can animate all of these um, different deformers. Right. We have a sine wave. So here's what sine wave does. Now again, low bound and high bound. This one works a bit different. This one is, um, does anyone remember math class where you have a sine wave? Yes. Okay, <laughs> that's what this is. This is a sine wave. This is basically just like a wavy pattern. That's all it is. Well, sort of, we're doing the fun stuff. 
So we have to give it an amplitude. An amplitude is the height. With a height of zero, there's no movement. So there's nothing the there. Flare? This is the um, sign. Oh. Flare is gone. We're done with flare. Yes. So you'll see this goes like this. We also have wavelength. And wavelength is how big this one wave is. We go from here to there is one wavelength. As I shrink this down, it'll add more wavelengths in there. So as I go, what? Right. If I grab the polygon and I move this, <laughs> you'll get that. Okay. So they always have to go together too. So if I move this shape, I got to move both. And the same thing. You can, yeah. Yeah, that actually makes me think of my heart monitors. Uh, where's my sine wave? Okay, we also have offset. So I can keep this shape essentially right here, but then offset it so that it's kind of moving. Okay. Um, I could also animate the drop off or add some drop off in here so that it's not fully blown. Um, Perfection. Right. It's not doesn't go all the way high like it is. Now something like this doesn't really make sense. So let me delete those and let me create a plane. Because some of these you'll just see better on a plane. There we go. So we'll put a sine wave on this. You'll see it comes in the wrong direction. So I rotate it downward. I add my amplitude. And it's actually bending it like this. So I'm going to rotate it this way. There we go. I'll change my wavelength to a smaller number. I'll add some drop off. Oops. That's not drop off. There we go. <laughs> so now we have some drop off on here. Um, five, ten. Well, I guess one's the highest we can go there. Um, then we can do the offset and get you know this kind of wavy look. That's way too high though. There we go. Makes me think of when it was larger of a. Uh, electronic voices, how they have the wavelength pattern. Right. And then we can spin it around. We could adjust the direction it's going. Really cool stuff. Uh, I'll skip squash for a second and twist. I'm going to go to wave now. Okay. Now wave is different than sine. Sine does it basically in one direction. So all the lines are parallel. Um, wave does it in uh, concentric circles. So same kind of settings, amplitude, wavelength, offset, drop off. Okay, uh, wavelength will lower down to this. There we go. So now we're getting like this little ripply effect. Uh, 0.5, there we go. And then we can do our offset here. And then we could add some drop off in here too. So now it doesn't look like the edges are going crazy. It just looks like we get this nice little ripple. And depending on. Yep, we can shrink this down to just like a little puddle, or we can make it huge, or whatever. And then we could also take take these down and adjust these too, so that now we only have this like ripple on the outside that's going to offset. And then you can change your drop off position too as to like where it's dropping off at. Okay. All right, so delete that. Go back to our cylinder. So now we have squash. And squash is going to take the factor, or the factor one is the one we adjust. And you'll see how it squeezes the inside and stretches the tops. And then as we bring it down, mm -hmm. squish and squash. Squish and squash. That's what it's doing. What it's doing. Now the only thing I don't like about it is how it does it. So you can see that this is pretty square and square, and these are pretty rounded. Um, you can adjust the expand to kind of compensate for some of that. You could adjust the max expand position to control how it's doing it. You could adjust the smoothness Oops. Yeah, sure. and smoothness. Okay, we still have low bound. We still have high bound. We can change the position. <laughs> so if we wanted to animate, like you know, something coming through here. Okay. We could also change the scale of this so that. As this is from the center of that, 
you'll see that now it's going to look like it's kind of squashing from the bottom. All right. We also have twist. And twist on this one, we have to go to wireframe to really see it. But it allows us to basically twist our surface. Okay. Now let me switch to a different kind of surface so we can see it. Square. Cube. There we go. And I'll add some divisions in the height. Twist, twist. There we go. So again, if we were trying to create something, model something that had this kind of twisty look, there yeah, we like go. Yeah, like a certain uh, fences or um, uh, like porch fences have those. Like a certain piece of candy that everyone loves. Twizzlers. Twizzlers. Mm -hmm. DNA. Yeah. DNA strip. Yep. Ribbon candy. <laughs> Ribbon candy. What are you, 95? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so these are the nonlinear deformers. They all work pretty much the same way. Um, it's just grabbing that handle and tweaking it, adjusting the position. Um, in each case, if you wanted these items to move together, like when we have a fish and he's swimming, we want all these deformers to go with it. We'd have to parent or group everything together so everything moves at once, okay? So those are those ones. There's a bunch of other ones in here too. Some of these we're going to tweak or look at. Some of these we're going to ignore for now. Um, some of these are just really cool for being able to model stuff. So let's say that I have a sphere and I want to kind of deform it. I can put on what's called a lattice. Okay, and the lattice is important because we'll get into using lattices with the fish, um, but in a different fashion. So you'll see on my sphere, there's a whole bunch of points on this. If I wanted to deform this and create some kind of different shape, I'd have to grab individual points and that's gonna look very messy. So what a lattice does, it creates this box. The box points I can deform and update what the shape looks like. So I go to lattice point, I grab these points and you can see how I can tweak it. And it's basically moving all those points right on top of there. Okay, so I'm able to create some uh, neat shapes doing that. Now what's cool about this too is that, just like the other one, if they don't move with it, then we get these kind of like weird changes here, okay? So we'll get into where we would use this in the fish once we get to that, uh, that level. That would be a fun house mirror right there. It would. <laughs> uh, what else do we have? We have soft mod. So if you've ever hit the B button before, when you're grabbing points, Oops. And this has happened to you. Okay, that's soft select. So the soft mod is essentially that. It allows you to create a point. I need to shrink my radius down here because it's like crazy big. Still too big. where I can deform a surface, okay? Now some of these I want to grab specific points, like I'm gonna grab this and add a soft mod. And so you'll see that it only affects the points that I selected, just like the fish, just like any of the other stuff that we're gonna do. We only want, when we wave the tail, we only want the tail to be affected. We don't want the whole fish to be like flopping, we want just the tail to move. So we isolate certain points, certain faces, certain vertices, certain edges, and then we can tweak those. So if I go to the soft mod here and I change this to uh, 0.5, uh, one looks good. You'll see how I can tweak this and only have these be affected. Okay, so the bottom of this is not affected at all by any of my deformer stuff. Just this, just those points that I have selected. And that's only the soft mod That's do all do of them. That's all the deformers we can grab individual points and do that to. Can you show an example of that? Because I've never seen that What do you mean? That's what it is. Oh, okay. So on the cube, I'll do it to the cube. So I have a cube here, and I have a soft mod. Create polygon cube. All right, so let's say I knew that I only wanted to rotate these ones, or I only wanted to bend these ones. I grab those points and put a bend on them. I pull this down to where I want it to start. I take my low bound off, and then when I do my curvature, 
make it a little bit bigger. When I do my curvature, it's only affecting these points, regardless of where this is at. Oh, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. So that way we're able to isolate it so we don't accidentally start moving other stuff. Imagine your character has a hand, right? And you're trying to modify just this finger. You don't want this finger and this finger and this finger to be affected by it or the hand to be affected by it. When I curl my finger, I want just the points that are necessary to be affected. Uh, yes. All right, so there's that one. And the neat thing about this is it can be animated, right? So if I wanted to animate a point kind of moving around, I could do that. Uh, what else do we have here? Um, sculpt deformer is kind of cool too. So we'll just delete that. Sculpt deformer. So the sculpt deformer, we get this sphere. And we get this origin. So the origin is basically like where it started from. Mm, weird stuff. But if I move both of these together, you'll see that um, I get this really cool effect. Yeah. Right. So if I'm trying to show my characters like chewing something, right? I could have this sculpt deformer like in their mouth so that their cheek is kind of moving. So it's pretty cool. Uh, nothing we need to use for the fish for this specific one. Um, all right, that's all I want to show for those. Okay. So now that's the foundation of it. That's the the basic stuff that we're going to be using to animate. Now just like the stick, just like the um, the castle thing, we want to be able to create controls for this, okay? So under modify, there's an add attribute, edit attribute, and delete attribute. So these three things we'll be using to create our own attributes. So that when we have something like this cube, like that, a lot more divisions, there we go. And just for fun, let me just grab this and this. Let me extrude, let me pull it out, add divisions. There we go, okay. So let's say I wanted to take this thing here and grab these points and add a bend deformer to it, okay? So I grab those points, I'm going to turn off my low bound, oops, turn off my high bound, there we go. And I want to animate this, okay? And then on this one, I'm gonna grab these points and I'm gonna add a uh, flare. And I want to animate, nope, not those, these ones, okay? And then on this one, I'm gonna grab those points, nonlinear squash, Make sure it's rotated the correct way. There we go. Take my low bound, oops, my high bound off. Check it out. Maybe squish this down a little bit further. Make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Okay, and then finally this one, which will be the twist. And again, I rotate it the correct way. I test it out, make sure it works. There we go, okay. So I have four different things that I want to control. Now what I don't wanna do is go into each one of those and control them manually, because you can see how big of a hassle this is to have to click here, to have to click here, then click this, and then tweak that. And then when I want to grab something else, then I have to go over here and then click this and then click that and then do this. And then when I want this one, I have to grab two things. Okay, then when I grab this one, I have to grab this and then go here and then adjust that. Okay, now as people who are animating this, we know exactly what we want to grab. We can write down a little list, um, just experience of doing it. We'll remember which ones we're supposed to grab. But ideally a rigger is someone who sets this stuff up and then passes it off to an animator to do the rigging, right? So just like your stick animation thing, you couldn't, um, you couldn't screw it up, right? You couldn't screw up what you were grabbing. Like you could only grab these certain things, you could only animate these certain things. 
So that's what we want to create for this, something that is basically a controlling device so that you can't automatically screw it up or easily screw it up, let's put it that way. Um, so the easiest thing to do is creating a locator. So if I make a locator, this is just a little 3D plus sign. That's what it is. That's one thing that you can use. It doesn't render, it's just something easy to select um, in your scene. Now in the castle scene, I did this on purpose, is that I used circles and all the circles are kind of clustered on top of each other. So that when you open the scene and you look at all your circles, you don't know what controls what, right? When you opened up the um, stick one, you knew these things rotate this way, this thing is for moving that because it had arrows in there, okay? So the, the preferred method is to go into Illustrator, draw something out, bring it into Maya. So just so you can see how I did that, we'll go into Illustrator real quick, draw some curves, and then bring that into Maya. That's the preferred way because we can actually create something that's very vis um, obvious of what we're editing. Here, if I made a locator for this side, a locator for that side, a locator for this side, and a locator for that side, it's very confusing because I don't know what does what, okay? All of these basically do the exact, or look exactly the same, so I don't know what is doing what. So what I want to do is I want to create um, some sort of controller that will tell the person this is the master controller, okay? So if I go into Illustrator, it's gorgeous. I make a new document, doesn't matter the size. Um, I like to start off because I, it, I really don't like drawing paths with the pen tool. If I can not avoid doing that, I'll do it, okay? So I'll try to get around it. So what I do is I go to the type tool, and then I wait. All right. Uh, we can also go to glyphs. Okay, and glyphs are basically symbols. So if we find a symbol in here that matches what we're trying to do, then we're, you know, we're golden. So let's say that we wanted to use this. That's kind of a cool symbol to use. And it's pretty obvious that it's not part of my scene. So someone might say, hey, there's the controller. I'm gonna use that to control my stuff. Um, or like that C is kind of cool, cool for control. You know, or just something random. All right, so let's just say that I wanna grab that Ooh, that's cool too, we'll grab that, okay. So I'm gonna grab this, maybe, there we go. I had to draw a text box and I can put it in there. Um, and then I'm gonna make this huge so I can see it. There it is, cool, so there's my letter. Now I can't take this into Maya because Maya doesn't know what this font is, it doesn't know what anything is. So I need to go to my type, I need to go to create outlines, and then this is now an outline, it's a path, okay? So then I can save this, and for now I'm just gonna throw it on my desktop, and this is gonna be my um, Illustrator Curve, Straightor Curve. Now, uh, an important step you can't, stick, you can't skip, you have to save this as Illustrator 8. Everything above Illustrator 8 has crazy stuff in it that Maya can't read. So if you ever go from Illustrator into like Cinema or Maya or 3ds Max or anything, it has to be Illustrator 8. It says yes. Good. So now I come into Maya and then I say create um, Illustrator object option box. I just want to create curves, and I'm just going to go to the desktop and grab that curve. Okay. So there's that curve. So that's how we get it there. Now we have a bunch of other stuff here that it comes in with. We want to get rid of all the junk. So I just click on the curve, unparent it with Shift P and delete that stuff. I center pivot this, center pivot. I move it to the center. Okay, that way someone looking at this will know that this is part of everything. And then I always delete my, or freeze my transforms. I don't like to have anything up here. I like this to be basically cleared out. So modify, freeze, transform. And now we're back to having nothing there, which is perfect, okay? So now none of these really apply to this. Like, I'm not gonna use transform or translate to move this thing around or rotate or rotate it around or scale, okay? Um, I would use none of these options, okay? So I'm gonna right click on this and just say hide selected. 
So now those go away. So I don't see them. Okay, I can still move it. Okay, if I didn't want to move it, I can just grab everything, right click, and say lock and hide selected. That way they're hidden and I can't move it. Okay, so if I want to make sure no one ever touches this, that's what I can do. You can touch it, you just can't move it. So now I'm going to add some attributes. So under modify, I'm going to go to add attribute. And there's a bunch of options here. It's very overwhelming. We only need to play with a couple things, okay? So we're making a new attribute. We give it a name. <clears throat> um, I've talked about this before when you name stuff. So if you name it with a lowercase first and then uppercase second, okay, not really literally writing lower upper, but the first word is lowercase and then the second word is uppercase for the first letter, um, it'll come out happily. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So um, this is wrong, and I'll hit add. See how it comes in here where it bunches everything together and it's kind of hard to read. This is wrong, see how it says it's hard to read. But if I put this is right, notice how the first word is lowercase and then this is uppercase first letter, uppercase second letter, and then I hit add, this is right, okay? Why does it make a difference if the first word is capitalized? Because it comes in right. <laughs> it capitalizes it anyway, doesn't it? it? Here it does it, yes. Mm -hmm. But if we don't type it in that way, it'll come up with, this cra with the crazy way of this one where it's bunching everything together like this. And this way it automatically recognizes that every new uh, uh, case is a new word, okay? Right, so you're just capitalizing it where a new space would be, okay? Uh, so this is called camel casing. So this is camel casing, all right? So that's what it's called, camel casing, when you put the first word as lowercase, then every new word after that, the first letter is uppercase. All right, so these obviously we don't want. I'll delete those in a minute. So we have a bend, a flare, a squash, and a twist. So I'm gonna call this bend, um, bend, we'll just call it bend, okay? Now the data type, <clears throat> there's six different data types here. We're only gonna be, for now at least, focusing on float. Float means any number, negative or positive, it can be a decimal point, it can be a whole number, okay? But float is what we're gonna use. Um, a vector is a three digit number, so that's like XYZ or RGB, we're not doing anything like that. Integer is a solid number, a whole number, so one, two, three, or four. So if we wanted to increment to just those numbers, that's what we would use. Uh, booleans is yes or no, on or off, just like visibility is a booleans, it's either on or it's off. Um, string is a um, set of characters, okay? So if we wanted to type in banana, we could type in banana and that would be a string, okay? Um, enum is our own list. So if we wanted to use red, green, blue, yellow, we can make a list using an enum. For now, we're using float. Bend, float, and then here's a minimum and a maximum. We'll get into these in a minute. So I'm just gonna hit add. Now the nice thing about hitting just add is it keeps the box right open. So then I can just go to the next one and say flare. Keep it as a float, hit add. Go to squash, float, add. Go to twist, float, add, okay? So all those were lowercase, all these came in uppercase, which is what I want. So now I'm gonna go to modify and I'm gonna go to delete attribute and delete my two ones that I don't need. Now those are gone, okay. So now I have this, these four here. Now just because I created those four attributes doesn't mean they're actually doing anything. They're just values right now, okay? They're just empty spaces. If I click and drag, they do nothing. So I have to tie them to these items somehow. Somehow I have to get these things to be connected. So let's go through and show different ways we can connect them. So here's my bend handle right here. So now this is not my favorite way to do this, but this is the most direct way to do it. So under general editors, there's a connection editor. Okay, so this is literally a one-for-one one connection. When um, I adjust my, my attribute that I created, I want to automatically adjust the bend handle to be the exact amount, right? So I'm gonna load my bend handle as my right side. I'm gonna load 
my attribute here or my item here as the left side. So basically what I'm doing is I'm going to connect attributes from one item to the other item. So I'm going to say that my bend handle here, my bend attribute that I created on this item, I want that to control uh, the bend handle on here. Now I don't actually see the bend handle. Bend handle on the top? No, it's not that. Um, because on here, see how this says bend one handle? The actual input is just bend one. So I have to click on bend one, then say reload right. That says bend one. And then if I scroll down somewhere, curvature. Okay? So that's all I have to do is I have to connect the bend here to curvature there. So what it means is when I adjust bend on my item that I created, it automatically adjusts the curvature on the other one. So let's test it out and see. There's no magic buttons, you just click one, click the other, and they're connected. So now if I click on this and I go to bend and I middle click and drag, see how now that is controlling the other one. Okay, pretty fancy. Okay, so now let's connect something else. So let's go to flare. Okay, so I click on the flare handle. I click on flare one, I reload that in the right, and I say I want to connect flare to end flare X and end flare Z. I have two items I'm connecting here, so I can just grab both. And just because this is highlighted and those two are highlighted, it automatically connects both of those up. Scoot that over, let's try it out. Click on this, click on flare, click and drag, and now you can see how that's adjusting both of those and I can still adjust bend. Okay, now let's do squash. Click on squash, click on the squash handle here, reload this, and go to factor. Okay, you have to know what's controlling what um, so that it obviously tweaks it. So now this one, squash, Oops. And I made a boo-boo here. I connected flare to factor. That's not right. Square squash is going to factor. There we go. So now I go back to this. I go back to my squash. Shrink that back down. There we go. Okay, so now I can control that one. I can control bend still. And I can control flare still. Okay, let's do the final one, which is twist. So we click on twist, we click on twist, we click on reload right, and we say twist will be controlling the start angle. Okay, so now we can click on this one and we can control all four of these items from here. Okay. Now here's where we would want to do something different than a one-to-one -one connection, all right? So if you look at these, let me reset. Well, let's just look at where they're at now, okay? So these are all kind of at a good example stage. So look at the values. Look at how far bend is. Bend is at 41.5. Flare is at 5.3. Squash is at negative 1.2. And twist is at 194.3. Sounds like a radio station. <laughs> So if I go back to the beginning, watch how long it takes me to twist something. So you see how I'm clicking and dragging and that's like taking forever. Now I can, if you weren't aware of this, you can hold shift while you middle drag and it goes quicker, okay? But I don't wanna have to hold shift to middle drag to make it go quicker. In the same instance, if I go to squash, look at how sensitive squash is. That's 1.3 and that's, one, negative one, okay? Now again, I could hold control and go finer, but again, I don't wanna have to do that. What I want to be able to do is in a very simple way, click on there, click and drag and create uh, uh, the ideal or the um, settings that I would want. Why is, oh, flare is really far down. There we go. So flare has to be at one, um, and otherwise it's just nothing. All right, so let's go through and create some other controls. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on all of these. 
and I'm just going to delete that connection. So I'm just going to right click and say break connection. So now that connection is gone from Flare. It's gone from Curvature. There we go. It's gone from Squash. It's gone from Twist. There we go. So now it's all gone. So now these don't do anything. Okay. So now I'm going to go through and do a different setup. Okay. So this is, like I said, a one to one. When this is one, that's one. They're both equal. Done. Okay. So close that. <clears throat> so now I'm going to go under my, um, I'll do one of my favorite ones, which is expressions. So this is my squash. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll do bend first. All right, so here's bend, here's this. So I'm going to go to the bend, go to the curvature, and under edit, I'm gonna say expressions. So this is basically just a mini script, okay? For most of you um, who have never written a script or written a bit of code, this is gonna be probably the hardest one that you're gonna to have to do. But it's usually one of the easiest ones to edit after the fact, okay? So let's say instead of a one-to-one -one relationship, we wanted to change it so that every time um, our manipulator here equaled, let's say, 5, that our bend handle would equal 25. Okay? So how would we get from 5 to 25? 5x equals 25. Adam? <laughs> 5 times 5. That was algebra. You said you didn't use algebra. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So if we take this and we multiply this number times five, we can basically make this one move five times as fast, okay? And let's say we want it to then move 10 times as fast. We can then multiply it times 10 really quickly. So I'm gonna go into here and we'll look at this. Now, just like any kind of code, it has to be written exact. So if you look at this example here, I'm just gonna middle drag it down into this so we can see it. So this says bend one dot curvature, okay? Um, spelling matters. It doesn't know what you want if you type something wrong. So we have to make sure it's spelled correctly. So the bend's curvature is coming from where? So I'm gonna say this is equal to, and there's my curve one. So it's equal to curve ones dot bend, okay? So this is the object, the bend one a dot separates and then curvature is the attribute okay so this is very much like um, sphere dot translate x or sphere dot rotate y object attribute a dot between them that's all it is um, capitalization matters too so the fact that this is lowercase here is the correct way so see how this is uppercase there it's actually lowercase. It's just showing us in a pleasant way to read it, uppercase there, but it's actually a lowercase. So if I hit create, you'll see down here it says expression one, success. So if I go over to my curve, I go to my bend, and I click and drag, you'll see that we are getting the bend curvature working, okay? So if I go back to my expression editor, and I look at this, um, when this bend here equals one, it automatically makes this one equal one, okay? These numbers are exactly the same. There's nothing modifying either side, so they're exactly the same. But if I take this one on the right and I say times five, what this is gonna do is it's gonna say when you get this value, multiply it times five, and then put that into the bend's curvature. I hit edit, I go back, and now when I click on this and drag, see how quick I can bend that now? Because it's basically when this is at 27 here, this one is actually at 137. And if I need to change that range, all I have to do is change this number. I want it to be a little bit more sensitive, so I'll put that to 10. Can so, you do like 1.5 or no? What was that? Mm -hmm. 1.5? Yep. So now look at, same thing, it's, look how quick that's going. I could do 0.1 if it's too sensitive, right? So now it's going to go even slower. OK. 
right? <laughs> it's at 321. I can do, let's say, 100. I want to be really sensitive. Oh my god. There we go. Okay, so now it's really sensitive. So as a rigger, part of the job is to understand what are the limits? What do we want this to do? Do we ever need this to do that, right? Do we ever need it to be able to go into itself and then spin around endlessly? Probably not, okay? And then as we animate this, how far or how fast do we want this to be movable? Do we need this to have subtle movements, okay? Think about like the next time you guys are brushing your teeth, if you do brush your teeth, look at all the intricate movements that your hand does like while you're like turning the br toothbrush around. There's a lot of subtleties of just holding an object. For something like this, it's not a big deal because we're not holding a toothbrush with it. But for a hand, you need to have that control. You need to be able to go in there and very smoothly tweak and, and modify each one of these uh, points. So for that, you need to have that ability. So like, oops, so like 10 was actually a good number. I thought 10 worked pretty good where I could go in here and bend and that was a good amount, okay? Now let's say I didn't want this to go that far, this far. That's as far as I want this specific bend handle to move, okay? I have my expression set up. I want to use this expression as the way to animate this, um, but I only want it to go this far. I don't want someone to be able to do that, okay? So remember when we had the add attribute and they had this minimum and maximum, that's where we can set those up. We can say, don't go past this number or past this number. So that's what I'm gonna do. Now, negative 26.9 is a horrible number to even go to, so um, negative 27 is where I would be. So I'm gonna go to modify and I'm gonna edit the attribute I already put in there. And I'm gonna say for my bend handle, you have a minimum, it's negative 27. You have a maximum, it's positive 27. Hey. There we go. And so now I'm gonna close it. So now when I click on this, and I go one way or the other, you'll see that it stops right at negative 27. So I can't, I can't go any further. So that as someone who's gonna be animating this, I can't F it up, because I can't go any further than that. It's like stuck to there. Okay, so I'm gonna do this, not the same thing, I'm gonna do other stuff to these other ones, okay? So now we have flare, or er, where's flare, there you are. So now we have flare, which is two attributes. Okay, so I can do the same thing to flare. Now when I come into flare, um, I need to make another expression in here. Now I can't just go to the next line and start typing stuff because Maya will not know where one expression stops and the next expression starts. I have to put a semicolon at the end of the line. When I put a semicolon, that means new expression, okay? And then I'm gonna type the stuff in exactly as, I, as it should be, okay? So this is flare, let me shrink this down a little bit. This is flare one dot and flare x, okay? Now I lowercase the first word, I uppercase everything after that because I know that's how Maya writes its stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna say equals curve, oops, uh, I believe it's curve one, yep, dot flare. I'm gonna hit edit, and you'll see a little purple thing. That's your indicator that there's an expression. You see a little purple line next to end flare x. That means that that's being controlled by an expression. Uh, I'm going to put a semicolon here, and I'm gonna type the next one, end flare z equals curve one dot flare. Okay, that way these two items are being controlled by the same item. They're being controlled by curve one's flare. So I'm gonna scoot that over. I'm gonna click on this. I'm gonna go to my flare and click and drag. Okay, now for this one, maybe I don't wanna go below one. Look what happens when I go below one. It goes opposite and it twists. Someone who's animating this may not notice it. I don't know how they would notice it, but they may not notice it. They may not notice that they've gone inside out and they can't figure out why it's looking weird, okay? So for this one, I'm gonna go to my, see how far we would go. And we'll figure that out later. I'm gonna go to my edit attribute and I'm gonna say my flare has a minimum and it's one. What? Now could you, now could 
you do that if you want to like unwrap like a candy or would that still look weird? Like what do you mean? Twisting it. Oh, twisting it. Yeah, you could do that. You could add the twist plus the flare on there, and then it would have the ability to unflare it and twist it, whatever. All right. So now I have this. I locked the maximum to 22 just so I could have a minimum. So it wouldn't let me do it otherwise. Okay. So now I can't go below that point. Okay. So now let's see what I want to do. Because I may not want this to be equal to an exact relationship. So I may multiply this one times a decimal point. Okay. So when I take something and I multiply it by a decimal point, that means it's going to be getting smaller than the value. Okay. So if this equals 10, 10 times 0.125 is 1.25. Okay. You can trust, check a calculator if you don't trust me, but that's the way it works. It's the same thing as me doing this divided by eight. Okay, that same works. exact thing. Was that? That works too. Yeah, that works too. Okay, so we'll edit that. <clears throat> now look what happens here, though. When I get into this, my one divided by eight is actually 0.125. So we do shrink down there. So maybe I don't want that, maybe I do. I'd have to you know, figure out what I want uh, with that specific thing. Okay. So that's not bad, that uh, range of motion right there. If I wanted it to go further, I can go to edit attribute, flare, and take my maximum up even higher, like 38. If I don't want it to go below that number, I'll just set this to 8. Okay, if the minimum is 8, 8 divided by 8 equals 1. I hate to throw math at you at 9 o'clock at night, but whatever. <laughs> okay, so the, the, it's all, so far it's, it's all just simple math. Okay, it's all just this item equals that item times 10 or divided by 8. You don't have to know what times 10 is or divided by eight is, all you have to know is dividing it is gonna make it go smaller and slower. Multiplying it is gonna make it go faster. Okay, that's all we have to know. All right, so that's two different ways we can use expressions to control our stuff. Now, if you don't like the general editor or the connection editor, you don't like expressions, maybe you'll like the third way that you can control stuff, which is set driven. And incrementally, people have the hardest time with this one, okay? Like expressions people can get because it's simply you're typing stuff in and making plus and minus and whatever else. But this one, uh, where am I at? This one is a little bit trickier, okay? So I'm gonna go to my start angle, that's that. And I'm gonna go to edit, set driven key. <clears throat> all of these are also available under all these menus. Um, that's the easiest way to get to it though. So we have two things, we have a driver and a driven, okay? The driver is the driver, it's the controlling object, okay? The driven is what's being controlled. So just a simple question, what's the controlling object in this picture? Curve. The curve, right? The curve is controlling everything. So for this thing, the curve is always gonna be the driver. So I'm gonna load that as the driver. So by process of elimination, what's gonna be the driven? The twist, okay? So make sure the twist is loaded as the driven. Not the twist handle, but the twist. Okay, so now we have to pick the specific item. What object is controlling what attribute? So my curves twist is controlling this twist's start angle, okay? Now this looks very similar to the connection editor where we were connecting one to one, but it's not, okay? So I'm gonna say this, 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 make sure all four things are clicked, and I'm gonna set a key. Now this is not an animation key, this is a rigging key. So that when I go back to my curve, um, you'll see that my twist is at zero. So what this means is that when my twist is at zero, I want my twist to be like this. I want it to look like that. When my twist is at, let's say, 10, what do I want this to look like? So let me go in here and twist it. That, okay? I don't even care what number this is. I just want it to look like that. When I take my slider and I drag it up to 10, I want it to do that. So then I set key, okay? So that's all I had to do. 
So now if I grab this and I go to twist, do you see how it automatically sets it to those points? Okay, so there's no multiplication here. It's literally just me saying I want it to go from here to here. Okay, so let me do that same thing on the other side on my squash. <laughs> just started with math. Uh, so I'm going to load this in my set driven. So again, this is my controlling object, my driver. This is my controlled the object, and this is my squash. Okay. So I'm saying right now that when my curve squash is at zero, I want this to be exactly where it is. Okay. So I just set a key. When my curves squash is at 10, I want this squash to be, let's say like this, like that. Yes, the, well the mech rig and the fish rig are using a lot of set driven. Uh, I love set driven, okay? So I set a key on that. Does this generate code for you or no? Does it generate code? No, it does like behind the scenes, but we never see it. Uh, so here's my squash. So it goes boom, boom. Okay. Now I could also set this to like negative 10. So if I say let's go to negative 10, and then what do I want this to look like when it's at negative 10? I can stretch it out and set a key. So now watch, we go. So I have my extremes. I have, I want it to go this far and that far, this far and that far. Okay. Now set driven is probably one of the most versatile ones because you can control 75 different objects without having to write an expression, without having to go into some crazy mathematical formula about how something's supposed to work. You are literally saying at this point you're here, at this point you're there. So think of like actual animation. At frame zero, the ball's here. At frame 10, it's up here. At frame 20, it's down here. That's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. So you know how you Right. If you were doing the set driven, how would you select two different parameters? Oh, okay. Just like that. Okay. So we can even use this as a way to, um, oh, not to that. As a way to control other stuff. Like, let's say that every time that we moved a ball up, we want it to stretch out. Every time we moved it down, we want it to squash. Okay. So let's scoot this one aside for a second and we'll create a sphere. Okay, I'm going to put on the sphere, there's muscle, doo, doo, doo. Uh, non-linear squash, there we go. I'm going to put this on the bottom, I'm going to scale it up so it touches the top, there it is. I'm going to get rid of the low bound, and I'm going to check out my factor. Okay, so what I want to do is every time I take this sphere and I pull it down, I want the ball to squash down. And every time I pull it up, I want it to stretch up, okay? It's not gonna look good, but it'll at least work. So what I'm going to do is if I just move this, obviously the ball's gonna move with it, so that's gonna look kinda funny, so I'll have to you know, tweak some stuff. Um, cool, so my driving object is my translate Y. As the Y comes up, it's gonna do something. As the Y goes down, it's gonna do something. So the controlled object is going to be, come on, this factor still. So I'm going to go to my set driven key. It doesn't matter what you select to get the set driven key up because you know you're going to have to make sure that the squash is down here and the sphere is up there. So sphere is the driver, squash is the driven. So the translate Y is going to control the factor. So right when it's here, set a key. Okay. When this goes down like this, I want that squash factor to squash. Now you can see how this is not moving with it. I'm going to hit undo a little bit and then just parent this to that. There we go. That way when I move this down, it goes with it. So as this comes down, I want the squash to squash. And then as this goes up, I want my squash to stretch. Okay, so now watch. 
So you see how I didn't, I didn't write an expression. I didn't just basically said when you're down, you're doing this. When you're up, you're doing that. Okay. Now, what's cool about this also is that we actually get um, curves. So if I go to my graph editor, here's the curve for that little animation that I just did, that little set driven. So if I delete the middle one, you'll see we get a straight line. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do something we haven't seen before, but I'm going to view infinity. So this shows you what your curve does before it gets to the curve point and before it, and uh, afterwards. And I'm gonna take my post infinity and I'm gonna say linear. And what that means is wherever it's at, just keep doing that, okay? So if I grab this handlebar and I say, um, that. I'm going to grab this handlebar and I say that. What? Come on. I don't know why that one's not moving, but the other one is. Bless you. Um, you'll see that I can take this squashing down and stays there, but then I can pull this up. And as it goes up, you can see that it's continuously squishing itself. So the further it goes up, the skinnier it's getting. And then as I pull it down, it squashes again. Okay. Now you can use something like this to control multiple objects. So like for doing something like set driven, uh, or where I would use set driven is let's say a, um, like the best example. Cause this was like, in class is one thing, this is the find, this is not Google. <laughs> Um, in class is one thing because we do this stuff. We're basically just like whatever our instructor tells us to do, we'll just do it and get through the assignments and then be done with the class. Um, but then when you get into industry, you're like, oh, I remember we used that thing here. I could totally use it there. So one of the uh, one of my students' first assignments was um, he had to animate this thing. Okay, he had to animate a convertible top. So all of the mechanisms that are inside here, all of those little pieces and the hinges and the whatever else, he had to make sure that all the stuff moved. Now there's no easy way to just animate something and going like back and doing that. Okay, it's, it's a very difficult, tricky thing to do, especially when you try to figure out any like mechanical parts. Okay, like something like this spinning around. Obviously that'd probably be easy. Um, there we go. Here's a watch. Okay, a bunch of gears right here, a bunch of mechanisms right here. So anytime you have these kind of mechanisms where you have all these moving parts, it's tricky to get everything to work together. But when you have something like a good rig um, and using stuff like set driven, it becomes very easy because you're literally saying this object here and this object here, I just want these things to work together. So when I turn this one 50 degrees, this one should turn 50 degrees or vice versa. Yes, sir. Is this like all tweeting? It, right, it, all, it, it does all the in-betweens. It's basically like animating the stuff or setting up the animations for it, okay? Now, just as another little example, let's say we had a cylinder. And I'm gonna go and grab every other one. There we go, I'm gonna extrude, pull it out, there we go, it's a gear. And pull this over here. All right. So here are my gears, and I'm gonna grab all these things and I'm gonna rename these things gear. There we go. Oh, come on. <laughs> I did not label them in the right order. There we go. There we go. Gear one, two, three, four, five, six. That's what I want. Okay. So um, for something like this, again, we could use set driven for this. I could go into my set driven and I can control my, all these things with set driven. I could go into my connection editor and control them with the connection editor. I can go into my expression editor and control them with the expression editor. As you get comfortable with using, using these three main ones, you'll find other ways to also incorporate these things together because these are just the, the baseline. That's all it is, just the basic fundamental stuff of this. 
So let's say I'm going to use the expression editor for this. So I'm just going to clear this out. I don't want to clear it. I just want a new expression. Window animation editor expression editor. There we go. Okay. So I'm going to say um, which way are these things rotating in the Y. All right. So I'm going to say gear one uh, twos that rotate Y is equal to gear ones that rotate Y times negative one. Correct. So these are the nice names. We can see it. Rotate X, capital capitals. If we go to um, channels, nope. If we go to edit channel names, you see it says nice. So it's showing us the nice names. If we go to long, this is the spelled out. You'll see lowercase rotate capital X. If we go to short, there's the short names. Okay. So we'll read the short or the long names. It will not read the nice names though. Okay, so gear two dot rotate y equals gear one dot rotate y times negative one. Now, why did I multiply it times negative one? It's going the opposite way, right? So, so now these two gears spin. So now, watch how easy this is just to copy this and now say gear three, four, five, and six. 3 will be times regular 1, this is times negative, this is times regular, edit. And now I have all six of these gears all working correctly. Now they're side by side, but that doesn't really mean anything. Oops. Because as long as I keep them in the right order, this could be over here. And then this one could be over here. And then this one could be over there. And then this one could be over here. And if I grab this and rotate it, they're all still working because they're all rotating the same way. Now, if I wasn't paying attention and I grabbed this one and I stuck it here, you'll see that that's going in the opposite direction. No big deal. I click on this, that's gear six. Now it's going in the correct direction. Okay? So, something like this, it's super easy to do because I can see it visually, I, I know how to work with this. With set driven, I'm using a graph. It's a little bit trickier to use, especially when we look at all six of these graphs. Okay. Now here's another way that I could do this exact same thing. I'll delete the expressions. This is a bit more complex. Correct. Now your when I show these, because there's a video where I go through. Here's how you rig the fish. Okay. But my video is walking through each of these methods, showing you how to animate pieces on the fish, and then saying, now you go and you animate it or rig it how you want to rig it. As long as your stuff works, I'm happy with that. Okay? So now I'm going to rig. I open up the hyper shade. Okay? So some of these things that we've seen before, holy cow, it's a lot of stuff. Um, you may have like realized, never realized what they are capable of. So one of the things inside here is a scalar utilities and scalar just means like mathematical. So if I go in here, there's a um, multiply divide. Where is it at? Plus minus average. Multiply divide. There we go. Okay. So under general utilities is multiply divide. That's the other one I wanted to get to. Okay. So this is actually a multiply divide node. So I can actually like say put information in here multiply it and then get it out. And some people like this because it's a bit more um, easy to visually see. So I'm just going to drag. Come on. All right, let me click on this. What? Why aren't you coming in here? Get in here. Uh, don't show assigned materials. All right, I'll use the node editor. and something else I can use. There we go, node editor. All right, so the node editor shows you all your stuff. So here's gear six, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, now if you've used stuff like Unreal Engine before, this might actually be an easy way to kind of play with your stuff. So on here, 
Uh, we can actually open up. Click too fast. There we go. Open up each one of these, and I can just connect. So I could just say. The only thing I don't like about this is there's just so much stuff going on. Let's just focus on one at a time. Here we go. So I could just say that the rotates for gear one are connected to the rotates of gear two, right? So it's basically this information is going out and being fed into gear two. So now when I rotate this, you'll see the gear two rotates perfectly. But you'll see the gear two is rotating in the same direction. So I need some way to flip it, to sw swap it around. So if I go to my um, create tab, oh, it's not that. Uh, tabs, no, bookmarks. All right, I'll just grab it from my hypershade. What was that? I know. I'll just drag this in here. There we go. So I just middle mouse button drag this into here. So what I'm going to do is say instead of going right to this, go to the multiply divide node first as an input. Okay, I go ahead and convert. And you know, uh, let me delete this. We don't actually need all three of the rotates, right? We only need the rotate Y. So I'll drop this in as a rotate Y. Yes, you can convert. And then I'll do the same thing here, take the output Y and stick it into this output Y. Okay, so it converts it however it does its thing. Now we're going to get the same result. Okay, but I can open up this multiply divide and I can multiply this times negative one and I'll get the correct direction. Okay, so then I could take this whole thing and say, okay, well, whatever, there's three, right? So three should be the same thing as that. So if I just go to this rotate Y and drop it onto this rotate Y there because two and three of the or one and three are the same and then five is also the same right and then four and six and two those are all the opposite those are all the negative And it might be hard to believe, like looking at this kind of thing, but some people prefer working like this. Oops, I don't want that. I want this. I guess that works too. There we go. All right, so now if we look at this, Oops, minus this one that I have to put back where he was. Everything's working correctly. Okay. So again, there's multiple ways to do this. It's just a matter of finding out what you're comfortable with. Okay. Now by the end of the rigging assignments, because we're going to have two major rigging assignments, we have the fish and then we'll have the mech rig. You should be going through and at least understanding the connection editor, which is the one to one relationship thing, the set driven, because you'll need the set driven for some things and the expression editor, okay? So you should make sure you're understanding all three of those, even if it's going into a blank scene and just screwing around for an hour to make sure you understand all three of those, okay? So once you're done with that, then you can actually animate your stuff, okay? So that'll be uh, obviously another, another lecture another day. But look how easy this is now. We have all our attributes right here. We can tweak these. twist, whatever we need to, okay? Oops, wrong one. And then that one, okay? But every rig you ever see, stuff like this, they're all set up the same way. They're all some sort of control set up so that you can manipulate and move stuff exactly the way you need to. And you have to understand how each one of these pieces is gonna move. Um, I don't know if I can find this right away. How things work, how things move. 